The Bob Murphy Show, episode 125. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. And this one, this is an unusual episode. My guest is Matt Mahai, who is somebody I've known for years from the Mises Institute, He was a fellow there when I was a professor teaching there. Um, He got his PhD in economics from the University of Wrocław in Poland. Um, He's founder of the Polish Mises Institute of Economic Education, and he's a five-time research fellow of the Mises Institute. And when he was there, he won some prizes because he was the best. He he did the best in the oral competition that we have at the end of the week at Mises University. Um, He's also the author of Capitalism, Socialism, and Property Rights, Why Market Socialism Cannot Substitute the Market. He's also author of Money, Interest, and the Structure of Production, Resolving Some Puzzles in the Theory of Capital. And finally, he's the author of The Rise and Fall of the First Galactic Empire, Star Wars, and Political Philosophy. So what we're going to be talking about today is those latter two books. So the first half of the discussion, we're going to focus on the structure of production and capital theory and Matt's views on that. And then the second half, we're going to focus on the Star Wars. All right, so we're going to do the broccoli first and then the dessert. But really, it's, it's, uh, it's not frivolous. I'll put it that way, All right? Even though it sounds like, oh, we're talking about philosophy and political philosophy and Star Wars. It, it's really good stuff. And his, his book is, is excellent. And so uh, you go to bobmurphyshow.com slash 125 to see the links and how you can get that stuff. Let me just, before we jump into the interview, let me mention two things. First of all, the interview with Matt, it's on YouTube, and I broke it up into two sections, right? So there's the full thing, but then I also uploaded just our discussion on the structure of production and just our discussion on Star Wars, in case you want to look at those separately. The other thing is, let me just briefly talk a little bit about what's called the re-switching controversy in terms of capital and interest theory, because that's one of the elements or episodes that Matt and I talk about. And so I didn't want to bog down the interview. So if you don't want to hear me discuss this right now, just go ahead and fast forward a little bit. But for those of you who want the context, so remember in the neoclassical tradition, you would justify things like, um, you know, why do, why do workers get wages? You say, oh, well, the wage and equilibrium is equal to the marginal product of labor and labor carries disutility, right? It's not fun to work. Leisure is, is a good and so labor is, is onerous. And so that's why it makes sense and it's justified that the worker gets paid wages because again, you're productive. The labor is physically productive and the worker needs to be compensated because it's, it's not fun to work. Okay, so that's why the worker gets paid wages. He's contributing something and he has to be compensated for his disutility. Okay, so then the question is, well, why do capitalists earn interest income? And so here, one of the standard answers coming out of the neoclassical tradition that Bumbavik helped found, I'm not saying Bumbavik should be called a neoclassical, but he, his work on capital and interest was involved in this approach in the early 20th century was to say, oh, well, because in equilibrium, interest equals the marginal product of capital. And so that's why, you know, capital is productive. You can have more stuff with capital than without. And interest, they thought, was the payment for that factor service. And people don't like to wait, right? It's, it's onerous to wait. People are impatient. And so it seemed like it was pretty analogous to, to labor, right? That the capitalist who injects his capital into an enterprise is making it more physically productive. So there's more output available. And the capitalist has to postpone consumption if he's going to do that. So, you know, he, he provides the means to compensate him, 
by enlarging production. And we have to compensate him here. He's going to require that compensation because it's onerous to, to have to postpone consumption. All right. So you can see how that's kind of analogous to labor to, to justify why is it the capitalist should earn an interest income in the market economy, just like why is it the worker should earn wage income? Okay. So th by the way, there are problems with that. I'm, I'm by no means endorsing the analysis. There's, there's things that are wrong with it, but here I'm not going to get bogged down on what's wrong with it. All right. And I would just refer you to my three part series on capital and interest theory so if you go to the show notes page here, bobmurphyshow.com slash 125, I will give the links to those previous episodes if you want to hear me spell out what's wrong with what I just said, okay? But in terms of the reswitching controversy, the uh, critics of the neoclassical synthesis who were coming at it from a, what nowadays we would call a progressive left-wing perspective, I don't know how they identified themselves back then, I, I don't know that they would all be socialists. I think some of them would have been, but I don't know if they all would have been. But people like Shraffa and Joan Robinson, like these are the people I have in mind. And they said that, no, this is a fallacy. It's, it's not the case that when capitalists save and accumulate, that that makes pr the production structure more roundabout and therefore more productive and so interest is the compensation payment to the capitalists for making our structure more productive, right? Because it's more roundabout. And they got that language from Bumbavark. That was part of how Bumbavark looked at things, all right? And so the reswitching controversy or the, the possibility of reswitching blew a hole, at least in the naive formulation of that defense of interest payments. And it went like this. You can come up with production technologies such that at a high rate of interest, so, so let me back up. You can imagine two different ways of producing something, like technique A and technique B, different ways of using like labor input to make some item. And, and maybe, you know, technique A involves a little bit of labor early on and then a lot of labor later on, and technique B is vice versa, okay? And the point is you can, it might be contrived perhaps, but you can come up with, an example, and Paul Samuelson did this, and so I'll link all this in the show notes page, folks, if you want to see it spelled out, where at a high rate of interest, technique A is preferable. Then you start lowering the interest rate, and at some point, technique B becomes more profitable. And you keep lowering the interest rate, and then technique A, once again, becomes more profitable. And so that's what they mean by re-switching, is they're saying as the interest rate varies across this large spread, it switches from one technique being profitable to the other, and then it re-switches back again as you continue to lower the interest rate. So you might say, what the heck does that have to do with the justification of interest income? Well, because if Bumbavark is right and there's ways that we can classify which production structure is more roundabout than the other, and the idea is that capital accumulation means more roundaboutness in the structure of production means things are more physically productive and then that's why the capitalists earn interest income is because, you know, their role in fostering this greater roundaboutness. By the way, but Bobber wouldn't necessarily say that. I'm just saying this is where the, the roundaboutness stuff came from is from him. If that, so if that's going to be true, then what they what would have to happen, so, so the allegation goes, is that as capitalists save and accumulate more and that pushes down the rate of interest, entrepreneurs then switch to the more roundabout production technique, right? Led by market forces. And so that's the sense in which, oh yeah. So as the capitalists engage in the socially beneficial habit of saving and accumulating that lowers interest rates and that's good for society at large because it leads the entrepreneurs to switch to the more roundabout techniques. Okay. So the re-switching examples show that that story can't be true in general. Because however you want to quantify roundaboutness, and that's part of the problem is it's not obvious once you leave really s simplistic examples, looking at two production techniques, which one's more roundabout than the other. It's not obvious a lot of times. But the point is, if you got A and B, and as the interest rate falls, you know, the interest rate starts at a high rate and one of them is more productive or profitable, you lower the interest rate, it switches so that the other one is, well, now you got to say that that other one must be more roundabout. But then if you keep lowering the interest rate, oh, it switches back so that the, the first one is now more profitable. Well, now it's like, well, they can't both be more roundabout than each other. That's, that can't be. 
So these types of examples show that in general, the standard story by which some people try to justify or apologize for the market's payment of interest income to capitalists can't be valid. And so then because of that, people like Schraffa would go on to say, oh, really interest isn't about, it's not a marginal uh, factor payment, you know, based on marginal principles, the way, you know, wages are due to marginal productivity of labor. And they would say, no, it's, it's based on power relations, right? The capitalists have more clout and that's why they're able to, you know, wring interest payments out of everybody else to like skim off the top of total output each period. The capitalists take their cut, but the principles governing how much they get paid are not normal principles of the market economy, the way workers get paid their wages, right? So that's the idea. All right, so that's, I think I've given you enough to know the context for when Matt and I end up talking about this episode in the history of economic thought. So that, that debate happened like in the 1950s and maybe early 60s. Okay, so without further ado, here is my discussion with Matt Mahai. Well, Matt, welcome to the Bob Murphy Show. Hello, Bob. Thank you for having me on. So this is interesting. You're like two guests in one here because you have a very important, interesting, path-breaking book on capital theory. And you also have a very interesting book on the political philosophy in the Star Wars saga, namely, in the, or specifically in the prequels. So I think we will cover both while I got you here. We'll do the broccoli first. And then we'll do the fun stuff afterwards. So we're going to start with the capital theory stuff. So let me, just to motivate this, I will read from your introduction. I have it pulled up here. Oops, there it is. That's the book. Yeah, yeah, I should hold the book up there. So Money, Interest, and the Structure of Production is the book. And here, let me just read from your introduction to sort of where you motivate what you're doing, the scope of this thing. Say the central proposition concerns the decisive role of the production structure, which unfortunately has been forgotten in the state of contemporary economics. I argue that models of interest and in monetary markets will necessarily be deficient in portraying the market process if they do not refer to the production structure. I plan to show that the notion of the production structure applies to various fields of economic theory, starting from purely theoretical models through more empirical yet still largely theoretical generalizations and ending with empirical works on potential output and, quote, optimal monetary policies. Each section is devoted to major puzzles in capital theory that could potentially be resolved by reviving the concept of the, ca of the production structure. And by the way, folks, I omitted, like you had things parenthetically there, and I, I skipped over those just for brevity. So there's your central proposition, what you're doing in the book. So why don't I pause here and let you elaborate on that, and then I think we should, as, I, as we discussed before we started recording here, Matt, hit the first two applications you do. So again, you're, you've got this idea that this is what economists have been missing. And then you're going to go through and show them, look at all these various debates or episodes in the history of economic thought. Why, if you'd had this concept more at your fingertips, you, you could have made more progress. Right. Now in the, uh, the book consists of two parts. One part is microeconomic in nature. And the second part is macroeconomic in nature. Now in the microeconomic part, I mostly play and discuss with uh, very, very theoretical models. And we have the famous re-switching debate about which you want to talk about. Uh, but this re-switching debate is more theoretical. Like I don't see a lot of, and this is this has been admitted also during, during the, the re-switching debate, that it's not very, very relevant empirically. However, it's really fun uh, to reach out and, and analyze the puzzles associated with it. Uh, what will be more interesting, I think, for people uh, uh, devoting their attention to macroeconomics, monetary policy, and so on, will be the second part of my book, which is, which is I, well, it's not longer. I think, yeah, the length is sort of similar. But in the second part, uh, Personally, I think that the most valuable, if you can say what you find most valuable in your work, but I think most valuable and interesting work will be chapter four on potential output. Uh, because in uh, macroeconomics, in, uh, in uh, mainstream macroeconomics, you have this notion of potential output, which is not only relevant for the beginning of macro modeling, but it's also very, very relevant for monetary policy. 
uh, especially when you look into the nature of crisis and, and in the nature of slowdowns and booms and busts, you always you will always see this notion of potential output, right? And uh, despite sophisticated modeling that you have in mainstream macroeconomics, it's based on one dimensional concept of potential output, which basically means that either you are I don't know, you, you need 5% more of real output to reach potential output or 10% more or 15% more. It's just one dimension, one number. Whereas thanks to capital theory that we have, especially developed by Austrian economists, uh, something on a theoretical level discussed in the first part of my book, thanks to it, you can understand that even uh, like you don't have to throw out the idea of potential output uh, totally but you cannot have it as a one dimensional variable as a one dimensional number because output is existing at various stages and at those stages companies are interconnected with each other and you cannot just say that okay we just need to produce like 5% more or 10% more in total when you look at the gdp because what matters is this heterogenization of the production structure, the fact that those firms have to be coordinated in some way, and it cannot be reflected by just one variable. Okay, great. So I jotted a note. Will, since you just said you thought the more important thing was was that element, why don't we go through what I had planned on asking you about the micro stuff, partly because that's what I know, and so I didn't have to prepare as much, so I was just being lazy <laughs> as an interviewer. And then we'll we'll circle back before we go on. So the bridge between capital theory and Darth Vader will be potential output. All right. And then um, I think no one on earth has ever uttered that sentence before. So why don't we, first of all, let's not assume anything. What do you mean by production structure, particularly, you know, in the context of the Austrian school? What, what does that mean exactly? Well, we, we mean that production is organized in stages. We have higher order uh, goods and we have lower order goods. We have goods that are earlier in the production structure, which are closer to uh, primary factors of production. And then we have all the later stages of production, which are closer to consumption, uh, which are already made up of, of uh, goods that have been manufactured by using other goods and labor in the past. And uh, then you can draw, uh, the, we have this famous notion of Hayek and Triangle, although perhaps the better term would be Hayek and Trapezoid, especially developed in, in Rothbard's book. Uh, so we can actually depict various companies and connections between those companies at the level of annual production, because that's another thing. Uh, that, that, that's another thing worth developing. Like I wanted to develop that in my book. I didn't really have time. But another thing to be developed is that you should have actually three dimensions in there, which is you just have the triangle, the trapezoid, whereas you could put the third dimension because this is a annual production in there or just just like a flow that exists through one uh, period of time. And you don't have fixed capital goods there that are used up throughout the multiple series of those processes. But that's something to be developed, I guess, later on. Um, OK, so maybe it might help some listeners because I think. If, if they don't know what the foil is, like what we're reacting against, they don't really understand because a lot of what we're saying might seem obvious. Okay, okay that's so, too long. So, yeah, so main, let me just say this. So like in standard, like the workhorse models, like when I went to NYU for grad school and the stuff we learned, I mean, it was, there was a production function and it was like F taking an input of K and L, like with a subscript of T to show you which time period it was. So it was like, oh, the economy has a technology function where you plug in, the total amount of capital stock and the total amount of labor hours that period, and then out comes the pile of output. And then society needs to determine of that output, how much do we consume and how much do we save and reinvest? And then that affects what KT plus one is going to be. So there, you know, there, there's, it's just, there's a pile of capital goods. It's all the same thing. In fact, the capital and consumption good are the same thing. And it's a very simple thing. Whereas you're talking about the structure, meaning like, multiple stages like oh there's there's mining and manufacturing and wholesale and retail so it's 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 a bit more realistic in the austrian yep. approach and the and the point is just even moving slightly towards that level of realism has a lot of implications oh yeah one of them is the importance of entrepreneurs uh there is a great clip uh on youtube you could find with elon musk when he was a guest uh, at rogan show joe rogan show mm -hmm. where he was addressing socialists and he was talking about uh production uh that, that, that many socialists are having this type of well he didn't call them socialists but that's what he meant and that's the title i think of the clip 
where he says that you have this simple notion that production is somehow sit, it's like sitting on a plant, right? We have this uh, notion of Cruzonia plant uh, mm -hmm. in, in neoclassical econom economics that you just you just sit on those factors of production and they are uh, inherently productive. I mean, things just produced by themselves. And then all you have to do is just to divide those goods. And, and Musk is really making fun of it in a very, very easy way. Um, but that's actually, that's the same thing he has in mind is that, you mm -hmm. know, companies are not, they are not sitting on capital, which begets profits or produces income automatically. Like you have to actually allocate it in the production structure, uh, to make it fitting with the rest of uh, the industries and to make it profitable and, and productive for the final consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mises wrote a lot about that too, that the socialists had this idea that, you know, to dispossess the capitalists, like all the, the bourgeoisie do, are going to their offices and sit at a desk and, you know, look at reports and cash checks or whatever when he was saying, no, like the real entrepreneurial issue is should, should that factory be built and where should it be built? That sort of thing. Not once it's up and running and you go in and you tweak, how many widgets do we produce? Do we bring on a third shift today? That, that sort of thing that those are actually, you know, trivial details compared to the bigger questions of sh should we open up a new factory in the first place? That sort of thing or even the decision not to sell your stocks. I mean, it's also an important decision in the secondary market. Mm -hmm. I mean, influence, it's actually influencing real world allocations, the fact that you don't sell your stocks. And it sends signals uh, about where capital should be allocated and who should get it. So, so even when you, quote unquote, do nothing, like you're a passive rentier, mm -hmm. uh, as Keynes envision, and envision it, it's still an important job to do, not to sell your stocks. Right. Right. That, yeah, that, that matters. If you refrain from selling, history unfolds one way. And if you do sell, then it affects the future. So, OK, so so your thesis again or your proposition for this book is. Keep economists historically, except for the Austrians, notably, haven't really had a well-defined concept of the production structure that they've used models that gloss over it or make it very simplified. And that has implications. And then you're going to go through and illustrate the ramifications of this. So your chapter one is on the interest as a factor payment, right? So there's just, again, for, for the listeners, to, uh, there's uh, w payments to the, the factors of production. So like wages are what labor gets. Uh, rent is what land factors get. So not just realist physical land, but also like if you own buildings or things, you know, you could call that rent. Or if you, if you have, um, own coal mines, things like that. And then interest, to, you know, historically in the, in the old classical, so they say, oh, interest or profits, what goes to capital. Now we've refined that after the subjectivist revolution and it's more, okay, interest per se goes, to, you know, to the, the time element and the pure profit goes to entrepreneurship, that sort of thing. So you're saying now, Matt, that that debate over is interest, what is interest a payment for or is it just exploitation, that sort of thing, you're saying the, the people arguing in there could have benefited from this notion of the production structure? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's sort of a starting point for mm -hmm. understanding the production structure. I would say it's not, uh, it's not, I would say it's, it's, it's something I wanted to discuss before going into the idea of the production structure okay. because I think it's really important because this is the price that actually directs the resources within the production structure. And this, this first chapter is, I would say, um, is mostly just research on history of economic thought, where I go through uh, the, the classical, classical, neoclassical thinkers and classical Austrians, ending with most important Austrians, modern ones, uh, the ones sitting in front of me right now, in front of the camera included. So, uh, but, 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 I, but I thought it's, it's, it's really, it, it is something that we should have in mind. And I really like your conclusion that we can treat like putting all those debates aside about what causes interest to be positive or not. I think what you do uh, when you treat the interest rate as a price is just sufficient. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you don't have to like go into, we can, I I'm, I'm happy for, we can discuss psychological factors like Bombard did, we can discuss praxeological factors like Mises did. We can even discuss some forms of productive factors like Hayek did. 
and and to some extent Bombaverk also. Like I, I don't have a problem with this, but 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 I think it's not crucial. Like I mean, to grasp the importance of production structure and the importance of market-based interest rates. Uh, like you don't have to go that deep. Like you, you don't have to reduce them to something sort of more fundamental outside of the monetary sphere. I think what you do is quite, I mean, it looks plain and easy, but I think it's really important because we can just stop at this, that, you know, interest rate has a price and, and every price has a function and that's it. And we can mm-hmm. just start from here. Okay. So, and I appreciate that. And I, uh, what I did when I got your book, the first thing is I went to the index and looked up my name and I saw there was a, it's funny. David Gordon says he does the same thing when he gets a book. He, he looks up everybody, Gordon. Everybody, yeah. Everyone does it. Yeah, not he, doesn't, he doesn't things. look up Murphy. He looks up Gordon. Um, so, <laughs> so but what's interesting here, so let me have you explain this because prima facie, it would seem that I would have thought you, you didn't like what I said there. So let me explain why. So here's, here's a quote actually from your chapter you say, what was the, so this is near the end after you've gone through and summarized, okay, this is what, you know, the classical people say, this is what Irving Fisher says, you know, Knight, Clark, the Austrians. And you say, what was the characteristic feature of the early marginalist discussions of interest, a focus on finding a fundamental phenomenon outside of monetary and market transactions, a phenomenon deeply rooted in something inherent in the nature of man or reality, a phenomenon that would not be imminently linked to existing institutions such as money or private property. And, and I agree with you, that is what they were doing there. So they were making interest out to be the, a, quote, real phenomenon. And you could conceive of interest, like Robinson Crusoe would, would you know, theoretically have it or implicitly have it in his island economy. A socialist commonwealth, you know, they would have some analog of that if, if interest is the return, either whether you thought it was the marginal product of capital and has something to do with the productivity of capital the way in the, you know, more mainstream neoclassical view, or even in the Austrian school, oh, it's, it's due to time preference right? Interest is due to time. Pre- Both of those, the, the reason I, in my dissertation, rejected those, and I thought Bumbaver, as much he's my favorite economist, I still thought he he made a mistake at step one, where he said interest was had something to do with the value difference between uh, present and future goods. Because I was saying, look at it, and all this stuff, you read me, money's not in there at all. And interest, duh, it's step one. What is interest? It has It's a payment for the exchange of present for future money, or as I said in the quote you have for me, you can view it as the the rental payment for renting money. If you want to look at it that way, you could say there it's more than that, or that's not, but clearly that's a true statement. And yet all these theories, including the Austrians, d- divorce money from it. And they say, no, no, interest, you know, money's just an afterthought. Let's look at interest as something to do with real goods and, you know, present apples trading for future apples, that kind of thing. So since you're, proposition this thing is to focus on the production structure that actually kind of surprised me I, so, but you're so you're saying yes the production structure is this physical thing is important but what you're saying we also can't lose sight of its connection to monetary transactions yeah yeah like i didn't want to lose sight from it exactly and uh, and then when i go into the researching thing you will see that i dislike focusing on real equations on equations on uh, based on real products in those uh, in those debates reswitching debates like i prefer to take monetary prices there okay uh, yeah so why don't we j- jump into that then so as i mentioned you met the audience will have if they elected to listen to it will have i gave a crash course on that just laying out the basics so you're saying that well, well I'll, go ahead so what we, we they i've summarized for them what the standard positions were and how you know the debate was over they in their minds the debate was over whether interest was a just justified payment for some service that the capitalists were providing that you know oh switching to a more roundabout technique allowed for greater production and so that was the justification that oh we need to pay the capitalists that because look at we're getting more output over time and you're you're saying what that that, that those those debates were too sterile looking just at like production yeah, structure pretty- that's the well. That's the consequence. Like, if you see uh, that, that that's that that's part of the reason why I wanted to settle the interest issue, mm-hmm. right? Because your simple solution is just is just like you can just look at them and say, who cares? I mean, interest is a payment for something that is traded in the market, and it has value, and you have bidders for it, and you have suppliers of this thing that leads to creation or to leads to existence of interest. 
And that's it. And and if you meddle with it, either through central banking policy or through uh, uh, nationalization plans, uh, expropriation of private property owners and so on, if you mess with it, you will have similar or even more important consequences as you have when you meddle with any kind of price. And this is something you can just say by doing a step-by-step uh, analysis of the price system. And you don't have to reduce uh, this price to something which is outside of the market sphere, like, like it is often done. Like You don't have to say, oh, interest is a payment for time. Oh, interest is a payment for impatience. Oh, interest is a payment for whatever that was, for productivity of land, if you're a mm-hmm. physiocrat. Something right, mm-hmm. or more, uh, more around the higher productivity, more or roundabout or processes. More roundabout, yeah, yeah, right. That, that was another one you wanted to mention exactly. So more roundabout process of production, because then if someone shows you, uh, like it was the case with the reswitching models, uh, that you can have this roundabout is changing in one way, and then interest first going up, and then going down, and then going up again then it means, okay, so there is no monotonic relation in here. So you cannot really say that this is determining fully the rate of interest. You cannot say that if if this changes either way and this changes not in the same way as we want it to change because of the simple model, then there is a problem. Then apparently interest does not perform this function, right? Whereas you are completely immune to this type of criticism because you're saying like, look, look, folks, it doesn't matter. The point is that it's just uh, market pricing, and and that's what's relevant. Mm-hmm. Okay, well that's that's good. <laughs> Can I ask you? I'm just curious. So, notwithstanding all of my complaints against Mbavrik and how I thought he got off on the wrong foot, I mean, there, to me, there's something obvious there, and it, you, you get where he was coming from. That there's a sense in which society A, where they don't save anything and they live hand to mouth, versus society B, where they Every year, out of you know their their produce, they save and reinvest a lot of that output, and they accumulate more tools and equipment per capita, and they have more intermediate goods and things like that. There's a sense in which, okay, now their labor ten years from now is going to be more physically productive per unit of time, and there's you know it seems like there's something there where you know Bavar was talking about the more roundabout processes are more physically productive, and that's one way of gauging what's the point of saving and accumulation uh, is the, even though, yeah, you can't come up with an airtight definition of what's more roundabout that that leads to problems. I mean, it still seems like, like if I'm going to explain something to high school class about why should people save, I'm going to start with the Robinson Crusoe model and just explain that to them. Like, so they can kind of see it in a simple setting. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I guess, yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, progress or development is always the result of being properly future oriented, right? And what is important, and you you see it reflected in all various cultures, you you also see it reflected in anthropology, like to whichever society you will go to, you always hear those statements about, you know, what you're supposed to eat today, tomorrow, what was you, what you're supposed to do tomorrow, do today, and so on, so on. So these types of, uh, or that savings is a virtue, meaning that thinking about the future and providing for the future is a virtue. So, so I guess, yes, in a way, uh, th- when you think about the future, your plans may look more roundabout, right? Mm-hmm. So in, in this broad general view, I would say it is helpful. Uh, but at the same time, like it doesn't, uh, some, even, even Rothbard saw this in, in, uh, in many economy in state, right. Where he has this sub chapter about how to perceive this roundaboutness, right. It's, that's, uh, sometimes that, that he even tries to make an argument that when you search for new oil fields, you're somehow, and, and you try to do it for the shortest amount of time, you're still reaching out for more roundabout methods, right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you, you you have to put a specific assumptions, very rigid, ceteris paribus assumptions on what you mean by reaching out for always more roundabout methods of production. And once you put all those conditions in place in the model, then tautologically you will, yeah, you, you will say, yeah, I reached the conclusion which is correct. And this is what I mean by roundabout. But then when you go into the dynamic settings, right? 
Um, it's not it's not the term that I particularly like. Uh, I think you can defend it in some way if you put much effort into it, but why do it? I mean, mm -hmm. if you just explain, do the Occam's razor, right? Just if you can explain the process without relying on it, even when you just use it loosely, it's fine, just like the way you presented it. Sure, mm -hmm. let's use it that way. But to make it like, 100% applicable in all cases, you have to do a little bit of acrobatics and complicate the stuff a bit. And I realized this during the seminars when I try to explain to the people who are not familiar with the Austrian economics, who are intelligent laymen. And then, you know, when I tell them about roundabout processes, they, they always respond. But you see, entrepreneurs always try to do everything in the shortest amount of time possible, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not, not, not the longer one. Right. But then you will say, OK, but longer depends relatively and so on. So, on. yeah, but they want to produce it faster. Like when you were producing tables 100 years ago, it took it took longer. Now it's, it's going faster. Right. Yes. Yeah, so there, so, I mean, there, I, there is a technical point where even Bambavrik stressed that more roundabout is not the same thing as saying more time consuming. Like it means that you don't directly approach your goal, but you do something intermediate first. But. But yeah, typically speaking, because of the selection bias, the, if there were a more roundabout, shorter process, you would do that right away. So that generally in equilibrium to have a more roundabout also is the same thing as expanding it. Yeah, um, I mean, sorry, let's interrupt you one more, one more thing mm -hmm. about it. Um, you know, what I really like about Austrian economics, I think, is that this type of reasoning 80 to even 90% of it can be easily explained to intelligent laymen without really going with mental gymnastics and redefinitions and so on and so on like you have in the neoclassical framework. Mm -hmm. So, but this roundabout issue is actually, doesn't fit that picture, right? This is something, in order to defend it, uh, you, you have to do some forms of uh, gymnastics. So why why really bother? That's Well, let me... Partly just so we can have some clash here to, <laughs> to not be patting each other on the back. But let me push back against that because that, that, that's what I was trying to get at it before. To me, it seems like what Bambavrik was getting at with that is pretty obvious. Like, And that's what I'm saying. If I were explaining to like a high school class, like for example, I, I don't know what the commentary is where you are, but here there's lots of op-eds and people wringing their hands over, oh no, Americans are saving the most they've saved since 1974 or whatever, the, you know, like – this is because of the lockdowns and whatever, Americans haven't been spending much. So the measured savings rate is really high. And so there's a lot of Keynesian analysis coming out, complaining about that and saying, this is terrible. We got to have spending or else we're in trouble. So I'm saying, if I'm talking to a regular crowd to show them, no, here's why saving actually is a good thing and it doesn't make us poor. Like just to talk about Robinson Crusoe and okay, he's just picking, you know, 10 coconuts a day. What if he saves two of them a day and builds up a stockpile and then five days from now he can go build some nets to catch fish with while he eats the saved coconuts? You see how that helps and blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, Japan saves more than the United States does. You see how over time they're going to blah, blah, blah. And people understand that. And whereas with this reswitching, it seems like the problem, like if, if some, you know, Paul Samus or someone wants to come along and say why that's too simplistic, they have to come up with this contrived example to show reswitching occurring so to me, it would seem like, no, the real common man on the street stuff is saving is good and you got to be more sophisticated to realize, oh no, there's a paradox of thrift and after we all try to save too much, we're going to impoverish each other. So how do you feel consider, about that? <laughs> consider me convinced. <laughs> okay. You got me there. Okay, so let me, uh, what do I want to say? So I guess the, do, do you think though that there is, so since you're talking about you know, the, the resolution with this stuff is to focus just directly on it that, hey, interest is a payment, you know, it, it involves like transferring money and things like, and that's a voluntary transfer of property. And if, you, if the government screws with that, that's going to mess things up. But do you also think that there is some tie to the real production structure? Of the monetary payments, right? Like what what investors are doing, like in interest in credit markets and things like that. Do you still oh, yeah. want to tie that to this this intertemporal production structure? Uh, you know, I don't think. I I think there is, uh, and this is this is what I because I generally agree that under the specific circumstances in the theoretical model you can show the so-called reswitching to mm -hmm. appear, 
I mean, it is possible that, 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 that it does happen. Uh, it's also possible that you can envision an equilibrium model in which lowered interest rate is leading to shorter uh, process of production in the production structure. You can actually design, like using the exact model that Rothbard was using, you can actually design using a budget limitations, uh, using uh, the same uh, type of approach, meaning um, saying that uh, present factors, uh, the, the, the owners of factors of production are, are demanding present money and owners of capital are demanding future money. And you can do the similar type of exchange as Rothbard is doing. And you can actually, while lowering the interest rates, you can actually make the process of production shorter under some little bit bizarre, but still circumstances. It is possible. But at the same time, even though it's possible in the theoretical model, like you have to uh, put that model into empirical perspective. And the empirical perspective is that once you have lowered interest rates and capital uh, owners are saving more money, they are investing it. Uh, in capital equipment. I mean, that's the idea in general. Uh, because this exception that I just mentioned would be possible, for example, if capital owners, for some reason, decided to just bid for wages, and that's it, or or hire more uh, workers in uh, in the earlier factors of in the earlier stages of production for some reason, right? Uh, it's not like completely impossible. You could do that, right? And under those circumstances, you can actually create examples in which production processes are shorter. But this is not how things happen in real uh, life usually. When you have owners of capital investing money, they usually do it to build capital goods and not to just bid for uh, uh, workers who have similar productivity or the same productivity and not just move workers from uh, the consumer sector into the earlier stages of production. They usually invest in capital goods and expand capital production. And once you have this thing, lower the interest rates and more savings will result in longer, in longer processes of production as it is depicted in, in Rothbard's and Hayek's framework. So I would say there is a tie, but it's not like 100% a priori. It's, I would mm -hmm. say, 99 or 98% a priori. Okay, so let me ask you this, and then maybe this will be the segue into the potential output stuff. So are you, the, the standard Austrian business cycle theory that Mises developed and Hayek refined goes that, okay, the banking system, they inject unbacked fiduciary media into the credit markets that pushes interest rates below, call it the natural rate, if you will, or the neutral rate or the rate of originary, corresponding to originary interest rate. And then that leads entrepreneurs to engage in male investments there's not enough total savings to finance them all. And so then a crisis is inevitable once that gets kicked off. Are you okay with that? Or do you think that, again, that's like a fable that we'll know because we can come up with theoretical examples where that wouldn't happen. So let's not no, rest would, our business cycle theory on that foundation. Sure. Uh, I would say, as Austrians do usually say, it depends uh, what is the channel of monetary transmission. That is, when you have lowered interest rates, the question is where the lowered interest rates are channeling capital, like in, in, in reality. And this is, this is the thing you always have to inquiry, even using the classical Austrian business cycle theory, because when you look into Mises, uh, I think it was Mises, right? Somewhere he discussed, um, yeah, he did. He called it simple inflation. When you have uh, credit and monetary expansion that goes into, for example, consumer sector, or government spending, mm -hmm. or let's say peace. You have monetary expansion and, and money created by the banking sector is being used to buy Greek debt and then goes into Greek budget and then is being spent on wages of uh, the people working in the uh, public sector. Then you will just have a, a sort of like government boom, but you will not have a classical boom bust, cycle, boom bust cycle as it is depicted by the Austrian theory. So you have to look at the monetary transmission channel. And I think the classical Austrian business cycle theory can easily stand even when you drop the idea of longer process or, or elongation of the process of production, because you can talk about something that Walter Block uh, uh, said at interest rate sensitivity of capital industries. And if the monetary creation and money creation is going into the capital sector, like you don't really have to point to the specific sector and say, oh, this is longer process. 
And this is a shorter process. If it goes, for example, to highly industrialized and capitalized, capitalized industries that are using heterogeneous capital, which is being used up over the longer period of time for the next 10 or 15 years, then you have a perfect demonstration of the Austrian business cycle theory, and it still stands despite the change, despite the fact that we can change the model like we just discussed. Because then it means that capital is frozen in form of heterogeneous capital, which cannot be easily reallocated during the change of preferences phase or during the, 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 the bust phase and so forth. So, right? so, so yeah, I think it easily stands and defends itself despite the possible reshaping of the narr narration about the capital structure. Okay, so let me try to repeat back and paraphrase what I think you said. So you're you're okay with the general story that for certain types of inflation, particularly if they worked through the credit markets and the way that new money gets into the economy is primarily in the beginning through loans, especially to business owners who then invest in capital goods, that can screw things up. That makes the production structure into an unsustainable configuration as opposed to a more sustainable one that we think would happen under a more free market approach. But we don't need to say, oh, what happened is the production structure was trying to be pushed into a, a more roundabout process, even though there wasn't enough savings to justify that, or it was getting funneled into longer processes when really consumers and their time preferences only wanted to fund shorter processes. Is that, is that what you're saying? Like, we don't need to get there and, and label it as such. It's just, more, let's say it's not correct or it's unsustainable. Well, I mean, I have a problem with, with the term el elongation. That's it. Mm. I don't have a problem with saying that it goes into the earlier stages of production and investing in more heterogeneous capital goods. Because this is what I think, this is what I believe to be the core of the Austrian business cycle theory, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't think processes are just getting longer. I mean, think about it. Let's assume that processes are getting longer, but the earlier stages of production are homogeneous and are using homogeneous capital that can be very easily re-employed in the other parts of the production structure. Mm -hmm. Even using the classical ABCT framework, I mean, the, the bust would not be such a huge thing, right? Because then right. you can just easily reallocate capital. So what I believe at the, what is at the heart, at the core of the Austrian business cycle theory and theory of socialism also is the heterogeneous capital aspect. Mm -hmm. And or you go into the highly equipped and highly capitalized industries at the earlier stages, then you will see more and more heterogeneous capital goods. And as they are more heterogeneous, it's really hard to, you know, move those machines or, or, mm -hmm. or any types of half products that you have from one sector into the other. Okay, great. So this, yeah, what you're, what you're saying here, I noticed that when I was at NYU in particular, and I was trying to explain, like, some of my classmates, you know, they were curious, like, what is this Austrian colloquium you go to? And, what, and I was trying to explain Austrian business cycle theory to them. And I realized with their framework, they literally couldn't even comprehend it. Because, as, as we alluded to in the beginning of this uh, episode here, Matt, the model they had in mind was that there's a certain pile of output that comes. It's all the same thing, like what just one, con, you know, output goods, and then a portion of it gets saved, and the rest gets consumed, and the portion that gets saved gets added to the ca the capital stock. You know, there's depreciation, so KT, you got a number it shrinks to a lower number. And then if the investment is higher than depreciation, that means KT plus one is, is higher than KT was if it's lower than KT plus one. So it's all the same thing. It's just a pile of stuff. And then in that framework, you can't have male investment. The, the, the worst that could happen is that you would have people save more than they should have according to the utility function. So they might, have they might have lower utility, but there wouldn't be a boom bust cycle. It would just mean, oh, next period, we got more machines. So now our labor is more productive because we saved more than we wanted to, or that than we should have. Yeah. And so, so, so your point is that with the heterogeneous capital and people making, so it's like uh, the, the simple example I, I say to people is something like, if if the economy, let's say we saved and invested more, and all they did was produce a bunch of hammers, but but they didn't produce an a bunch more nails. And so then next year, now all the carpenters are walking around with a bunch of hammers and there's no nails to work with. That doesn't make them more productive, even though, oh, there was a bigger capital stock because it's not the right stuff and the structure doesn't interlock. So does this 
tie into like what you were talking about potential output? Maybe we can switch now to that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of the consequences. Like, if, if let's say it's the early '90s and you have a perfect boom uh, that is being caused by lowered interest rates, and you have huge investments in Kodak factory, for example. Right? I mean, imagine all this specific heterogeneous equipment used in Kodak factory. Right, thinking about you know expanding output and producing more and more and more, and then in the first years of this boom, you will see huge increases in GDP and huge increases in real output, and you might even have some forms of modeling that will completely say that will, that will, that will actually say that uh, you know this is not like this is this is actually reaching out for the potential output, right? So potential mm-hmm. output here, and then real output reaching potential output because we have this, these lowered interests. Rates and we have employment of capital, uh, w- w- which is homogeneous in the model, or quasi. It's actually quasi homogeneous in the model, uh, in all those DSG mod- uh, DSG models. So uh, I mean, in 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 with the usage of this simple one-dimensional concept, you will not see the potential mal investment being manifested there, because you are just focused, as you just said, as on, on the economy based on the economy that is mimicking physical. Uh, reality, or or not even just mimicking; it's it's incorrectly mimicking. I mean, it's it's the model in which physical parameters are taking over uh, from the monetary and and uh, judgmental parameters, right? I mean, this is something that is they crowd out, right? Just like you have this in your criticism of Samuelson and and his model, where you crit- criticize this K K thing stuff that you just mentioned. Uh, too bad we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't get the response from him that he promised uh, to criticize you. <laughs> Would yeah. be interesting to see. But uh, but yeah. So so um, by by simplifying the economy, even using sophisticated mathematics, because DSG models are really difficult. You have many equations, hundreds of them, or variables, hundreds of variables. Uh, even though you have it, I mean, it's not it's not properly capturing this. Uh, multi-dimensional element of the production structure and coordination, therefore. Okay, folks, by the way, what Matt's referring to is for two of my papers that were history of thought involving Bambarik and capital theory, one of the referees disclosed his identity and it was none other than Paul Samuelson. And in one of the papers, I was criticizing him and he said to the editor, go ahead and publish this piece by Murphy because then I want to respond to it. And unfortunately, he died before he ever did that. So that was, you know, one, one of the tragedies. Peter you know, Holzman would probably, with his black humor, say, the question is, what is the connection? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just make sure everyone got, because what you just said there was really important. The So the way, and, and I'm sure you've seen this too, Matt, the way Keynesians are trying to explain, so let me back up. After the 2008 crisis, there were several types of economists who are coming forward and saying, hey, we actually kind of need to let this bus just run its natural course. Of course, the Austrians were saying that, but there were even other mainstream economists, like I think John Cochran and people like that. And they were saying things along the lines of there was an overinvestment in housing. There were too many workers who were getting pulled into Phoenix and Las Vegas building housing. They need to go somewhere else. We can't just keep housing output the same 2010, 11, 12, as it was in 2007, or let's say 2006, because there were, it just doesn't work. There was there was a, an unsustainable boom there. There's a skills mismatch and it takes time. Arnold Kling was talking about his recalculation story and things like that. And so what the Keynesian said in response was, no, 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 look at potential output, right? We have this the same number. Look, look at what output was in 2006 or seven and how it was rising unsteadily. We had investment going through those years. So potential output should have kept rising. It's not like, Everybody, all the engineers forgot, you know, their skills or all the computer programs forgot their skills. We had the same amount of land. It's not like there was a natural disaster that destroyed a bunch of factories or 18 wheelers. And so we should be able to produce as much stuff in 2011 as we did in 2010 or let's sorry, we should be able to produce as much in 2009 as we did in 2008 and seven and, and actually a little bit more because we had net investment. If we didn't, we're falling short. So clearly they conclude it's a problem of aggregate demand that there's just, there's not enough being people aren't trying to buy as much product as we physically are able to produce. And so, so that's really where the, and, and again, that's being, the reason they're thinking that is because that their framework doesn't even allow for the possibility 
that maybe there's something in the production structure that allowed the flow of output goods in 2007 to be a certain amount, but then going into 2008, no, it has to come down just physically. Yeah, I mean, uh, I honestly have to say that this uh, thing about real production and production output and the estimations that were done by Congressional Budget Office after 2007, I think it's the most comical thing or close to most comical thing I have ever seen in economics debate, seriously, because when you when you look at, like in 2007 2008 they were or in 2008 they were saying that real output is lagging behind potential output and we need monetary and fiscal policy to make sure that the gap disappears that real output will reach potential output and then and then they repeat the whole story for like another 7 years but what is really comical about it is not that like it didn't happen that real output reached potential output. It's the other way around. Mm-hmm. Potential output reached real output. And and when you look at the projections that they offer each year from 2007 to 2013, 14, 15, you will see, yeah, the gap is disappearing, but it's not because real output is getting higher and reaching potential output. It's because they change the estimations right. because they, 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 they adjust downward the potential output. Right, which which shows you in general how ridiculous this is and, right. and the whole estimation. Yeah. So what I think happened was like in terms of how they come up with their numbers and estimates. I think what happened is, as the I'm, I'm talking to the audience. I, I know you probably know this, Matt. So it may, there was a certain plausibility from their perspective when in 2009 and two, 2010 when when the unemployment rate was still pretty high, and then they looked at what real output was. They said, Oh well, if, if only this many people are working and there's whatever, 5% of the labor force wants to work and they just can't get a job right now. Clearly, we could be producing more, so there must be this gap. But then over time, as the labor markets appeared to recover, and you know, we can quibble about how much of that was just people dropping out and so on, but when the official headline unemployment rate came down under the alleged Obama recovery, then after a while, and, and yet real output, like you say, didn't surge upward, after a while, they're saying, well, wait a minute, maybe potential output wasn't that high after all, because at this point, you know, we don't have massive unemployment anymore. The things, it seems like, you know, things are back to capacity and yet real output is, is on a lower trajectory. So I don't know if you saw this, Matt, but what was really hilarious, as you know, I followed Paul Krugman as, as, a, as a side hobby or as a side job. He flip-flopped. It was amazing. In the beginning, he was doing what you said. He said, well, the reason we need, mon- you know, looser monetary policy and since there's a liquidity trap and the the cowards at the Fed are afraid of Ron Paul and blah, 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 and they won't do unconventional means. So we, that's why we need fiscal policy. Like you said, it's because look at real outputs lower than potential QED. This is due to mon- this is due to aggregate demand. Then later it like these Jackson Hole conferences and whatever, people were presenting papers showing how the, the uh, austerity and blah, blah, blah is causing potential output to grow at a slower rate because now workers, their skills are atrophying and stuff like that. And so then Krugman flip-flop and said, we need fiscal and monetary policy because potential output is too low, right? right? I mean, so it was whether potential output is, is higher or lower, the answer is always this proves the need for fiscal and monetary policy because we're empirical, not like those ideologues who already know the answer ahead of time. I remember this, yeah, of course. And I remember it thanks to you because I, I'm not really a big <laughs> follower. So I use division of labor. Okay. Someone has it for me. Okay, so why don't I give you one moment here to probably to other economists. Like, what, 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 are, what are they going to get? Why should they get your, your book? What is that going to give them? Well, I think uh, uh, what will be most interesting is this chapter four on potential output, I believe. Uh, because this is this is something uh, something that is at the core of any macroeconomics, and I, I'm I'm really disappointed that it's not discussed at length um, at macroeconomics courses. Mm-hmm. I think it should be. I mean, I think macroeconomics course should start with it. Uh, what is potential output? How we understand it? Can we measure it? What types of measurement can we use? What type of methods are being used? Uh, one of the methods, by the way, is, is is just trend estimation. You just do the logarithm or mm-hmm. or, or just try to estimate from the past trend real output. Uh, the, the, uh, sorry, uh, potential output. So that means that you know real output is actually 
producing sort of potential output, not the other way, not the other way. It's all it's admitted in the method itself, right? right. That, that you you just trace it through the actual data and not by some sort of economic reasoning. Uh, so I would say this is the most relevant and, and important chapter, and I would recommend uh, uh, especially for this reason. Then all the consequences that follow from it, a uh, little bit for long-run macroeconomics dealing with economic development, which is detached from monetary and finance, you know, over 10 decades, two decades, three decades, and so on. Uh, but it's especially relevant when you want to go into the issues of fiscal policy and monetary policy, because then you realize that it's a form of sorcery if you don't have it properly explained, uh, uh, this potential output. So I, I would, I think that's the strongest thing. The first part uh, about the restriction and so on, this is more wonkish and it's, it's mostly for the people who are really, really interested in tiny details of, mm. uh, uh, of microeconomic theorizing. But the second part with this uh, and then, and then things that follow from it, says law and, and then the business cycle. Uh, and then what was the fifth one? Oh, oh the um, uh, quantity theory of money. Yeah, I have a little re- restatement there. Uh, but, but I would say this is, this is the reason to, uh, to reach out for the book. Okay, and maybe just to make sure people are getting that point, because it really is critical. Like you mentioned dimension. So I guess the way they're looking at potential output now, it's like a scalar quantity where it's just a number, like it's a magnitude. And oh, is potential output higher or lower? And your point is, well, no, if once you realize output is actually, if we want to use physics, like a, a vector of different types of goods and services that are flowing even if you just went to a too good, I mean, that's what I did a lot of stuff, you know, at NYU and the papers I did where Samuelson was the referee on is I just went from a one good framework to a two good framework. That's all you needed to do, right? So in case people are misunderstanding, we're not saying like, oh, any model is too simplistic in the real world. No, we're saying if you just have one good as the output, that's going to mislead you. And I think that's a pretty modest claim that <laughs> most people would realize, yeah, your model should have at least two goods. Otherwise you might miss some nuances in the business cycle. Because then the physical reality is actually surpassing monetary or exchange reality. When you know, when you just assume one good, for example, and that this good is abundant uh, or not scarce, simply you will not have prices. I mean, it will mm-hmm. be just available, and then everything will be driven by its by its physical properties, right? Whereas when you just introduce one more, like you did in your paper, just one, just one more thing, where you have exchanges happening, everything changes. Then, then mm-hmm. exchanges matter. Then preferences matter, not yeah. just physical reality. Yeah. Yeah. And again, to drive home the point, like just thinking through, like what, what if you're saying, okay, output consists of hammers and nails. And so you could see there, there should be some proportionality there, you know, to year for the potential output rising. And if one year output was just a lot more hammers, and even if you measured it in dollar terms, because it clearly like they, you know, in other words, the mainstream accounts aren't stupid. They understand there's more than one good in the real world. And so they, they do it to, with money prices and they have an index to, you know, account for price inflation. But again, you could imagine it looks like real output surged in a certain year. But if that was all hammers and no nails, you could see how next year it can't possibly be the case that real output's going to grow another 2%. It's going to fall off a cliff because everyone's going to say, wait, there's no nails anymore. I mean, something as goofy as that, you can see the problem. And yet they really do reduce all this stuff. Just as you say, they just do a trend typically to say how much should potential output be going up year by year. 